Good morning. I'm glad you all uh, survived the party last night and could make it this morning. Uh, today we're going to talk about the recipe for scaling internationally when you're a European company. So I have the pleasure of being joined to my right by Alex from N26. Uh, Alex, you're head of international markets at N26. And Max of Vestiaire Collective, you're the CEO of Vestiaire Collective. Now, I want to share some uh, personal experience uh, before we start. When I first started covering the European startup ecosystem out of Paris 10 years ago, scaling seemed like an impossible thing for European startups. I remember you know, when Deezer first started launching outside Europe, it was like, you know, good luck, guys. If you make it, call us back, right? It was the same for companies like uh, Viadeo and the same for, even for Vente Privée. And that has changed. I'm joined by two companies that have managed to scale across Europe successfully and have either already expanded internationally or are looking to expand outside Europe. And so I want to start there. Uh, can you talk about why things have gotten maybe easier or why European startups today are more successful at scaling? And we can start with you. Yeah. So I think uh, everything is driven by the customer uh, and initially the shift in user behavior from offline to online to mobile over the last 10 years and, and some pioneering companies who have uh, taken, taken the advantage of that, such as the Spotify's, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, they've really changed globally the perspective on, on what's possible. And I think it's very much like this, uh, you know, the four minute mile. So if, if there's the first company who really scales a, a customer proposition globally, many others follow, to, uh, regardless of, of where they're from. But I think also companies from Europe are in a great position to go international because across Europe you can serve many countries and, and you deal with a lot of differences in, in culture, in language, in, in customer preferences and that really sets you up for success when you also look for, for countries outside of Europe. Max, what's been your experience? Sure, I think, I think the customer perspective is a really important one but I think the most important reason why this has changed over the last five to ten years is you know, also that the European companies have said, why should we let the American and the Asian companies have all the fun? Um, you know, and the ambition level should be set as high, um, you know, in any European company and with every European entrepreneur that it should be set with an American um, uh, or Chinese uh, entrepreneur. And I think that kind of mindset was, um, you know, supported by, you know, investors who have gotten a much more global mindset and are uh, encouraging companies you know, that have the right um, to be global, um, to do so. And when I say the right to be global, um, you know, I'm, you know, I think companies should be very reflective on, on, you know, if they're a global or an international company or if they're a company which is differentiated by being, you know, extremely good in a local market. Um, you know, for us at Vestiaire, you know, you know, we are French, we are Paris, that is fashion. Um, but what we sell and what people consume is global. Um, so for us, having a global footprint was, was, you know, always the key for, you know, our value proposition because we wanted to connect, you know, the global wardrobes of this world. So I think it's really the combination of do you have the right business model to be international and when you have the right business model to be international, you know, do you have the ambition, do you have the aggression and do you have the support from investors um, to go for it? Max, how early do you think entrepreneurs should start thinking about going international? I think it's, you know, from day one. I think you should, you should understand what is your business model, how much of your business model is tied around the, the specifics um, of what it is you do and if it is what you do is global and is applicable to global consumers. Um, then you should always have that in mind because if you start building a company um, with a global mindset, you approach the scalability of everything that you're building, starting with the tech, starting with every process that you build, starting with the, the mix of the management team, whether it's international from day one or not, uh, your mindset is, is completely different. Um, but I think you really need to have that honest discussion, you know, how do you differentiate yourself uh, in a global marketplace from day one. You shouldn't just expand for the sake of expanding. 
Alex, you mentioned earlier how you know, managing Europe in itself can be a challenge. Um, the fragmentation of the European market is something investors and entrepreneurs often point to. What's been your experience with regard to that, including you know, cracking the regulation uh, puzzle? So in, in our industry, in the, in the banking and financial services industry, I think Europe is really a leading, leading market where it's the only market in the world where you have a single, single market. So with one license, you can actually serve the entire region. Um, th that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, and that's uh, also driven by European directives that would shape regulation that is very relevant, such as um, anti-money laundering regulation or things, how customers, uh, consumer protection regulation, they all come from European directives, and as such, it's much easier to navigate across multiple European markets than it is anywhere else in the world. And I think that makes Europe as such one market with roughly 450 million people that you can serve with one license. And that's immediately the second largest market that you can serve in the world after China with one license. So if you think about it in, in our industry, how many customers can you serve with one license? Europe immediately, like therefore, is, is much more attractive than being 31 different countries, so to speak. So from, from the basic infrastructure and regulatory perspective, we see it very much as one market and we can also offer our services fairly easily in all markets. But then it comes to how do you actually interact with the consumer? That means you, you, you change the language in your app, you change your customer service, you, you may tweak the product to, to a certain extent to meet the local demands even more. But from the infrastructure perspective, you're, you're instantly set up to go in all markets once you do this initial investment and get a license and build that infrastructure. Max, what's been your experience? How difficult is it to you know, crack Italy if you've done France or crack the UK if you've done France? Um, for me, I think that the complexity is um, very much around you know, how much do you understand these markets and how do you serve these markets. So it's, it's less about the complexity of each of these markets. I mean, we should not forget that each of the German or sorry, each of the European, whether it's the German, French, Italian, the UK market are really big economies um, and you know we shouldn't keep on telling ourselves in our head that Ger Europe is this small fragmented market. These are big markets, much bigger than the markets that uh, my previous company Lazada served. I mean even markets like Indonesia are from a GB GDP perspective barely bigger than Spain. Um, so, so we're serving big markets so when we serve these markets you know it's really how do you approach them, how do you uh, run them, you know, what is your management team, you know, do they sit in these markets, do they sit in headquarters, wherever the headquarters are, um, how do you trade off between the economies of scale, of, of, of managing economies of scale across a fragmented market, so what are the things that, you know, you run functionally in HQ or not, and what are the things you run in, in the local markets, and that trade off and constant conflict between local and, and, and global or local and regional and um, you know I think is, is probably the main job that that m myself as a CEO and the management team have to manage and you know I've personally have not found the, the perfect solution for it both at Lazada and here there's always this you know competition between what happens in the market and what's happening in the headquarters you know the markets will always say oh those guys in global HQ living or an ivory tower and we know what it really means and the guys in the Headquarters will always say, well, those guys don't think in big long-term solutions, um, but I think that's part of the fun. Uh, Max, before this panel, we talked a lot about finding the right balance between something you're describing here, being international and keeping a local foot track. Yeah. How do you do that? Um, I think it's really about how you set up the company, whether you call it kind of microservice, whether you call it mod modular, you know, any fancy kind of tech term you can use, but for me, it goes. I really try to dumb it down to the to the easiest kind of concept that most people understand since their childhood. It's basically a bunch of Lego blocks. Yeah, I think the way you build a company is think of every process, every um, you know piece of your company, whether it's the function or or a country. It's it's basically a Lego block, and you need to think, you know, what is the composition of Lego blocks do I need for each market that I want to serve? And which of these Lego block pieces can I scale across more than one market, two, three, five, ten, you know, global markets? Um, and, and, you know, these are really, that's really the difference between the trade of 
of the economies of scale of having some percentually and, and the localization and putting that together in the best way um, that you do it. And that, that mindset of thinking about scale, which I said earlier, is, is you know, you really need to have that mindset from day one. Otherwise, if you just run and expand in lots of markets and you figure out afterwards, oh, we need to centralize now and, and, and find the economies of scale, that's a very tough place to be. On the other hand, you start and saying everything needs to be central and then you want to go out, you're going to have a very hard time competing against local competitors. So I think it's really trying to find that balance is, is absolutely key. Uh, Alex, you've launched around Europe and you're now starting your first uh, steps in the US. Why the US and as a Euro European company, do you go first to the US or do you try to crack some Asian markets first? What's the more natural evolution? So when, when we look at markets, um, we, we look at the what's the opportunity, so where, where is this how many customers per license can you serve? That's sort of for, for a bank that you want to scale globally, very relevant metric in terms of the, the growth opportunity. And then we look at the complexity to enter. So how, <clears throat> how is the regulatory environment? How is the competition? How, um, the, you know, uh, how's the technology available there? So what are the different factors that, that we need to enter the market sort of from a complexity perspective and the opportunity? And that then leaves you with a segmentation where you can then talk about the biggest markets that are the easiest to enter, sort of, right? Um, and there, for us, the, the US was, uh, was fairly clear because, you know, you have the same language, you have fairly similar consumer behaviors, you have, uh, from a regulatory perspective, also um, federal licenses which, which help you to serve the whole state. So US, I think, was, was fairly easy to decide on to do next. It was more after the US, what do we do next? And we, we just started an office in, in Brazil, actually, a couple of months ago, um, which was a, a bigger consideration in terms of do you go to Asia, do you go to Latin America? Um, and I think for us, it was, uh, again, coming back to, to the metrics I mentioned before, but then also staying within the time zone. So, you know, while we, while we launch in the US in the next couple of weeks, um, we want to then launch in Brazil um, next before we go and open like another hub in, in, in a third time zone, so really strengthening the, the footprint in, in that sort of time zone as well because you have a lot of operations, you know, customer service and, and these different things that need to follow the sun, so to speak, um, and, and we want to make sure we have a strong footprint in those two, two regions and then perhaps looking to Asia uh, after that. Asia would be the next step. Uh, Max, you've been in the US for several years already, Vestia Collective. Uh, you're in some Asian countries as well. How would you compare expanding to either of those markets? Where are the difficulties in each and the opportunities? Um, I think the way I, I look at it is that I think the US is obviously a huge market just from its pure scale and size. But I look at the Asian markets as much more nimble uh, in a sense that, you know, in the end, I think all of us are disrupting something in some sort of way. And, and, you know, the key thing for disruption is that you can move at speed and that you can convince people of whatever you are disrupting, they should adopt to it in a very fast way. And I've, you know, learned again from my previous life of, you know, living in Asia for the last six, seven years across Southeast Asia, that, you know, in markets which have been underserved in the past, um, and you know where you have things like mobile adoption just being light years ahead of Europe or, or also the US, the ability to, to disrupt and scale at speed is just much faster and that consumers, you know, based on the fact that they haven't gotten spoiled with every service they've had have in the past, um, are just much faster in, adop in adopting new technologies uh, and, and adopting new uh, services in some sort of way. So I think you know, it's, it's interesting for me coming back from Asia now to Europe and, and, you know, you hear investors, you hear companies still being very much um, focused on the US because it's the obvious step. You start off in Germany, you start off in France, you start off in the UK and then next you go to the neighboring country and you spend two years trying to figure out if the same thing works there. Uh, and then, you know, after two, three years, you, you know, you, you, you build up the confidence and you're saying, now we're going to go across the pond. And Asia is almost a bit of an afterthought. I mean, just the fact that we talk about Asia is one big thing. 
um, shows how little kind of nuanced we are because Asia is, well, what do you talk about Asia? Is it China? Is it Southeast Asia? Is it Japan? Is it Korea? Which is a completely different market. Um, so I think the opportunities in Asia are, you know, so big because the addressable market is, is big. The, the speed at which people adopt technologies is much faster. And you can really pick your battle based on which of the regions in Asia you think are applicable to whatever business model you're building. Very interesting. We have uh, questions from the audience popping up here. Vivek is asking a good question. What's the best way to test a new market? Um, so, uh, so what What's is the, the best, best way to test a new market? <laughs> um, I'm uh, notoriously bad at testing markets. I just kind of go for it. Um, because I kind of find that the best way to test it is by being there. I'm, I've, I try to avoid kind of drawing too many PowerPoints. Um, I think you kind of look at the three, four things that as, you know, a manager or a founder or a CEO, you know are, are distinguished to, to make your business model succeed. And, and I'm a kind of a big fan of just going for it. Yeah, I think you need to keep the balance of doing too much and kind of getting ahead of yourself. But I'm very happy go lucky in 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 our context <coughs> you can't do that with a bank can you <laughs> so in in our context it's obviously a huge investment to enter a market so having some kind of confidence along the way or some kind of proof is very very helpful and we have for every country that we're not available in around the world you can leave your email address if you're interested so it's very interesting to you know just do and do a query and see where does naturally interest come from from people who are just leaving their email address and saying, you know, when are you coming? So to speak, waiting lists. Um, and for instance, Brazil was, was the market that had such strong interest without us even announcing that we're going there. So I think there were 20,000 people who just left their email address without us ever talking about Brazil. So that's just a small indicator. But for, for if it's such a big investment to go into a market, I think it's important to, to validate along the, along, the, along the way. So we opened an office there two months ago. The first thing we do is user research. So we, we go there with the user research team, we interview, we validate, um, sort of to, to make sure along the way that it actually makes sense to continue. But very much like Max is saying, on the other hand, it's just like you see Brazil, you see a successful player locally, you see a change in regulation, you're like, okay, we need to do this. Um, but, but then you, you, know, you need to validate and you need to um, also look at the data then. Someone else is asking, you know, where do you decide to put your headquarters? And I would broaden that question out and say, you know, where do you decide to set up offices? And how important is the talent question and the ability to attract uh, talent within that decision of where to set up your offices? Uh, Alex, I think you guys have offices in Berlin and Barcelona, which is pretty attractive. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about sure. your strategy? Yeah. So when, when we look at where we open offices, especially because we look to, to open product and technology offices um, because the talent in, in product and tech is the driver of, of the pace of your company. So when we realized we cannot scale in Berlin fast enough, we, we thought where could we find attract and, and attract engineering talent from around the world. And so on the one hand side, it's where is local talent, but also which city has a reputation and a quality of living that would make you an attractive global employer. So. Think about it, we, we, we hire people from around the world, could be from Asia, could be from India, uh, sorry, obviously India is part of Asia, but any country in Asia, any country in Latin America, and you can say, you can either live in Berlin, Barcelona, or New York, right? That, that helps your global employer proposition, and that's very, very important to think about, okay, where's, where's talent locally, but also which cities help and contribute for people who want to relocate to, to move and work with you. I I'm, I'm see Paris is missing on your list of attractive cities. I feel uh, very angry about that. Uh, Max, you guys have offices in Paris, obviously. So can you please yeah, I think, I think make the, me feel better here? <laughs> uh, I feel always so irrational next to him. He seems very... <laughs> I, uh, so I think, we, I, I, had up, I think the office should be based where you, know, you as a management team want to live and where your life is in some sort of way the easiest to then manage once you scale. I think, f you know, and previously when I lived in Southeast Asia, um, the choice for headquarters was very obvious. Living in Singapore is 100 times nicer than living in, in Jakarta or Manila. Um, just because, you know, 
And at the time, I spent so much time traveling and so much time, you know, having to go to airports, not going to airports, and doing that out of Jakarta was just n never an option. Um, and, uh, you know, the second thing is that the connectivity of the place you're in needs to be really, really good. Uh, for, you know, Vestiaire now, Paris was, you know, obviously the company was founded in Paris, but Paris was the absolute obvious choice because, again, um, fashion is Paris and, and we're a fashion business, so we have to be here and we want to be here. And the great thing about Paris is it has uh, amazing connectivity, better than Berlin, I think. I'm still amazed when I see that there's no direct flight from uh, Berlin to London with Lufthansa. You have to still take Air Berlin or no, they don't exist anymore. Air yeah, no? Berlin is out. Is out. Um, uh, no, I think the connectivity is really important. The standard of living is really important. And, and of course, you need to attract talent. But I think if you're, whether you're in Singapore, Berlin, Paris or Barcelona, I think you're doing a, you're going to have a good time convincing people that these are amazing places to live. Maybe I can just very briefly add two more things. First, when we look at hiring engineers, it's also very important that the market that the office is in, the, the product is also available as a customer. Because engineers, they work on the product and they want to see the result. They want to see their friends using it. They want to, you know, so it's, it's very important that we don't open an office where our product is not available. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing is cost is important as well as an as a early stage startup in particular. Sort of, you know, where do you, where's the cost of living, um, uh, you know, reasonable. So that's why Berlin, I think, is, is one of the cities that has evolved to being really a hub in Europe for for startups because uh, the cost of living is fairly low compared to all other cities we talked about in, in, in Europe. So we have 40 seconds left only. So in like three words, let's talk about money. Has it gotten easier to raise money as a European company? And is it something today that's you know, not the main obstacle for scaling or is it still an obstacle? In like three words. Well, I think it's still very difficult to raise funds. It's not a no-brainer to, to raise uh, 500 million, for instance, but I think it has become a little bit easier as it becomes a more global market. Good summary. Yeah, I think it, it has become easier to, let's say I compare it to 2011, 2012, um, just from a pure you know, number of investors you can talk to and, and the checks that are being written. But I think, you know, I think where Alex is right that it's very, very hard you know, you still have to have a good business model, you still need to have good execution, you need to have a great team. So um, I think once you get over the hump that these things are working, it's then easier to scale the, the fundraising, but it's still as hard to get over the first hump, I think. Interesting, thank you both. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the conference.